So to be a God to you and to your seed after you. Now let's look at this next slide here for a moment. To what seed? To what seed? Well, let's look. Let's take it physical. Let's just, for the sake of argument, hypothetical situation, totally untrue, totally false. <laughs> the hypothetical situation, let's look at the left and physicalize it. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you and in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God to you and to your seed after you. Well, so what I did is I took that little arrow there and pointed it up to Galatians, New Testament, written by Paul. And to Abraham and to his seed, the promises were spoken. It does not say to seeds as of many, but as of one and to your seed, which is Christ. Do you realize what God was saying to Abraham? My promise is between me and you and your seed, Jesus Christ. The covenant was between Abraham, me and you, and your seed after you. That's why Jesus said this is the new covenant in my blood. This is the new promise. And the most amazing thing about it was the promise was given 430 years before the law was given, the Old Covenant. Isn't that wild? Think about that. The Old Covenant was given at Mount Sinai to Moses, and the Bible says in Galatians that the New Covenant was promised 430 years before the Old Covenant was given. So now let's look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. And I say this, a covenant having been confirmed by God, how? In Christ, the law coming into being 430 years after does not annul the promise so as to abolish it. In other words, what he's saying is, look, remember what we've learned about the law. The purpose of the law was to what? drive them to Christ. It was the taskmaster. For those of you who have never been exposed to this before and have wondered what was the purpose of the Ten Commandments. The purpose of the Ten Commandments was to show you you can't obey them. That's the purpose. You can't obey them. That's why Jesus said, you have heard it was said of old, you shall not commit what? Adultery. But I say to you, whoever has looked upon a woman to lust after her has committed it in his heart. Do you see what that does? The purpose of the Ten Commandments was to expose our hearts. It was never meant to gain us entrance into his favor and kingdom. And so that's why he says this, and it's so important. He's saying that law, which showed you to be sinful, you Jews, and also for us too, there's so many Gentiles who are sitting there looking at the law and saying, man, I've gotta, we've got to obey this law perfectly. And God's saying, no, the whole reason I gave it to Israel was to show them how sinful they are, that they can't save themselves by it. And so Gentiles would do well to learn from the fact that they couldn't obey it. And if they couldn't, who were God's national people back then, surely we will not be able to do it, who were never chosen as a national people. Never. We learn from their example and say, whoa, the law was meant to show them their need for Christ, not to give them life. And so he says here, and this is so beautiful, he says the, this new covenant, which was promised 430 years before the law was given, he says the law cannot annul that promise. Isn't that great? That's so beautiful. But it was a promise. It was a promise. And because of Israel's transgression, God gave the law and said, girl, <laughs> she was, she was called a girl, right? She, she's called a she in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. But he calls her a whore. <laughs> he says, you are a whore. You are a prostitute. Why? What have you done? You have gone to other nations. You have sought after justification by the law and not by me. The Bible says Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him for righteousness. Yet Israel, what have you done? You've looked to other nations to protect you and you've looked to your own power and works by obeying the law to protect you and give you life. And God says because of that, you have the mark of an adulteress on your forehead. 
That's what he says. And he says, you're worse than an adulteress and a prostitute. That's what he says to Israel. You're worse because you don't say, hey, pay me money and I'll give you my services. You say, you find this in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, you say, hey, I'll give you money and I'll give you my services. That's what he says. You're worse. And that's why he says in Isaiah chapter 55, come buy wine and milk, what? Without price. Salvation is free. Deliverance is free. Eternal life is free. That's what grace means. It's a gift. You don't sit there at Christmas and give someone a gift and say, that'll be $25, please. <laughs> wouldn't that be weird? You wouldn't be invited over anymore. <laughs> I mean, that would be terrible if the price tag was left on the wrapping paper under the tree. You're like, oh my goodness, I got to pay for all this? What a drag. No, the gift of eternal life is free. Why? What does the Bible say? For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, let's look at Hebrews chapter 7. For truly, and this is what the new covenant did. This is what the cross of Christ did. For truly, there is a putting away of the commandment which went before because of the weakness and unprofitableness of it. What does that tell you about the commandment? The law. It's unprofitable. It's weak. Why? It's weak through the flesh. Romans chapter one or 8, verses 1 through 8. That's what the Bible says. It was weak through the flesh. You could not obey it. He says, for the law made nothing perfect. But the bringing in of a better hope, namely Jesus Christ, did. By which hope, what? We draw near to God. It is through the cross of Christ we draw near to God. It is through the cross that we have entered into the presence of God. Some people don't understand that. They say, well, I believed in Jesus Christ. My sins are forgiven. Do you realize what it means to have your sins forgiven? It means you are now in the presence of Almighty God. And you can come boldly before His throne. You get to come before the throne of the King and say, I'm forgiven. I have everlasting life. I'm cleansed. I can stand in the presence of a holy God because he has made me as holy as his son. Outwardly, no. Inwardly, yes. He's cleansed your heart. You say, can you prove that from the scripture? What did he say? He said, for the law made nothing perfect. Implication? The cross did that. It made something perfect. Let's find out what it is. What needed to be made perfect? Because all of us can attest to the fact that physically speaking, physically speaking, we are far from perfect. As far as our thoughts, far from perfect. So what was made perfect? Let's look at this in Hebrews chapter 9. The Holy Ghost making evident that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest or clear. This was written in the first century while the temple was still in place. While the first tabernacle is still standing, which is a figure for the present time, in which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot listen. This is talking about the sacrifices they did in the Old Testament. Those gifts and sacrifices cannot make him who does the service, service perfect as pertaining to the what? Conscience. Conscience. And some of us might be saying, well, wait a minute. Well, that really stinks because I never have a pure conscience. How many of you feel like you have a pure conscience all the time? Come on, think about it. A pure conscience all the time.